we're supposed to be a representative democracy, but if the people in our party are not being represented by the leadership of our party, which is kind of where we've been at and the situation we have, then that's a little bit of a problem. So um, hopefully we'll be seeing a realignment over the coming years where we can mm. get um, more actual representation. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm president of American Moment, and I am joined by Nick, but he's off doing something. I have no idea. Um, uh, he is on for the entire episode, though. We tape this a little bit separately from the main bulk of the episode, typically. Um, as always, make sure to go to AmericanMoment.org to, have, uh, to take a look at everything we have cooking. But one thing that is super urgent this week is uh, we are doing a SNAP conference on foreign policy with our friends over at the American Conservative, the future of conservative foreign policy. It's called Up From Chaos, Conserving American Security. And we have an amazing lineup of speakers confirmed. We have everyone from Rand Paul to Thomas Massey to J.D. Vance to Joe Kent. Uh, we have people like Rachel Bovard, Dan Caldwell, Will Ruger, um, Molly. Hemingway, uh, you know, just tons of fantastic speakers. And um, it'll be happening right here in Washington, D.C. in person on March 31st at the Marriott Marquis. Um, you can go to our website, AmericanMoment.org, and you can find it under the events tab, or you can just go to our Twitters. We've been promoting the heck out of it. And uh, we really hope you'll make it. Uh, the attendance is pretty affordable, um, but the prices will go up at the door. So make sure you sign up ASAP. Uh, and if you're a journalist looking to cover it, we do have press passes. Um, you'll be put in the fake news journalist pen and that'll be okay it's where you belong but uh we we would encourage you to come anyway it's going to be incredible and we're gonna we're gonna think through in this moment of geopolitical conflict what the future of a conservative foreign policy looks like and also if you go to our website you can find the application for the fellowship for american statecraft which is our flagship program where we place um you know uh fellows all over washington dc at uh, public policy organizations in congressional offices to learn the basics of what it means to work in the lines of work that we are trying to get thousands of young people involved in so that the conservative um, uh, personnel that staff these offices uh, believe like we do on all the priorities that we do. And so uh, that's AmericanMoment.org slash fellowship. The application closes on April 1st. So hurry up and get your application in. We've already started looking at them and uh, we hope you'll uh, you'll apply for that as well. This week we had on a uh, fantastic uh, fantastic guest, uh, John Gibbs, who, uh, if you know who that name is, uh, you're, you're, you're pretty, uh, well informed. He was the director of the, um, uh, well, he was Trump's proposed director for the Office of Personnel Management in the White House. Um, unfortunately, didn't make it through Senate confirmation, just ran out of time at the very end. But those of you who don't know, the Office of Personnel Management is essentially the HR department for the entire federal government. So all those issues we had with personnel in the Trump administration, they could have been ameliorated if John Gibbs had had his stab at fixing it. But unfortunately, ran out of time, didn't get a second administration, but he's now running for Congress and running on a pretty interesting agenda out there. Obviously, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. So uh, having on John should not be seen as an endorsement or disendorsement of his campaign. It was for educational purposes only. And we dive in um, to some of the stuff that he did earlier in the Trump administration when he was the assistant secretary um, for the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, in the Community Planning and Development Department. So we talk about what an America first housing policy would look like and how to put families first and prevent these globalist entities from having uh, that price of housing jack up constantly. It was really interesting. You're going to learn a ton. And John is a fascinating guy. And he was a software developer who was on the team that was testing and developing the iPhone and then went on to uh, be a missionary for seven years in Japan, is fluent in Japanese. Just a weird, fantastic, brilliant guy, the kinds of uh, person that we need thousands more of involved in politics. And we're so grateful to just uh, get his wisdom and, and learn a ton from him over the course of about an hour or so. So we hope you'll enjoy this episode. And we'll go now to John Gibbs. John, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. We always like to hear how people got to the point where they are now. Uh, you're certainly not like a typical swamp creature. You've had a, a, a pretty interesting journey to get here. Why don't you walk us through the 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 tale and times of John Gibbs. How'd you get here? <laughs> sure. Um, so I was born and raised in Michigan. Uh, growing up, uh, I really enjoyed school and I know that I liked foreign languages. So I did really well in Spanish. Um, and I also actually liked Japanese anime movies, weirdly enough. Um, it's a pretty popular thing, I guess. But, uh, you know, they offer you kind of something different than you see in American Disney type movies. And it tends to be kind of appealing. So I got into those and I said, maybe I should learn the language. 
And first, I think I might have started with the Chinese. I said, I love the, the characters. They look really complicated. Could be a neat thing to kind of learn how to read those and learn all about that. So learn a little bit of Mandarin at first. But then I said, well, since I'm into animation, maybe I should switch over to Japanese. So I started learning Japanese on my own a little bit and found that I really enjoyed it. Um, so I knew when I went to college, that was something I wanted to study a little bit as well. So it was into that. I was also really into computers, probably more into computers than anything. And my mom got us a computer when I was in high school and I proceeded to hog it. So my sisters can never use it. <laughs> so um, I learned how to program a little bit and learn how to make web pages and things. So uh, really enjoyed that. And so I kind of decided that I wanted to do computer science as my major. And so I was out looking for colleges and uh, applying. I uh, focused on schools that were good at that. So I ended up graduating and going out to Stanford uh, because they have a good computer science program and it's right in Silicon Valley. So it would be good for job prospects and whatnot. So I left Michigan and went to a place where you could wear shorts in February, <laughs> um, which was pretty awesome. And yeah. all the guys from L.A. would be wearing their, you know, jackets and, and uh, hats and stuff when it was like uh, 60 something degrees in February, whereas all the Midwesterners would be wearing shorts and the T-shirt. <laughs> so you could really tell where someone was from just by that. But um, it was a really great experience. Um, I learned quite a bit on various fronts, especially in my major of computer science. I did study Japanese as well. And I actually studied abroad in Japan while I was uh, there. Uh, and so what years would that have been? Uh, I was uh, Stanford 97 to 01. Okay. And I studied abroad in Japan in the year 2000, which is pretty cool. I had a homestay family in Kyoto. And so uh, they were fascinating. The father spoke a little bit of English, well, his own version of it. Uh, and the mother only spoke Japanese. So you got to practice with her as well. Yeah. So that was just a great experience as far as emerging and getting to go deeper into language. Then I had an internship with a Japanese company, which was extremely fascinating because my company uh, in Yokohama had no foreigners there. I was like the only, maybe there's one guy from Indonesia somewhere yeah. else in the building, but that was it. And so it was a really, really Japanese environment. And one of the things we had to do, for example, is every day at like five o'clock on the dot, all the employees who had been there for less than one year had to take this big garbage uh, bin, roll it around, take out everyone's garbage at their desk, throw it into it and say, what's got some of this? which is Japanese for thanks for your hard work today. <laughs> and so um, you're going around saying, this. and they, they'd abbreviate and say, scus, scus. <laughs> so we're going around saying this, so we're dumping everybody's garbage. So it was quite a fascinating thing you don't really see um, here, at least. So then you take it down, uh, the garbage bin downstairs, and the guys would smoke. And I, I didn't smoke, but I would just kind of hang out for the cultural thing. And uh, that's where a lot of the deals are done. You know, they talk about who's going to do what project. This guy is not doing well on the project, so replace him with it, that person. So it's kind of interesting how they do things there in terms of the the informal stuff is where the important stuff happens sometimes. So mm -hmm. uh, just learning little lessons like that through being there was really interesting. But I came back from that, graduated, and uh, started off as a software engineer in Silicon Valley as my first job. And I worked for a small startup company that made cybersecurity software. Our co-founder was a high school dropout but uh, kind of a, a hacker type guy, one of the smartest people I've ever met. And he basically made the product and then built out a team around it. Then we got acquired by Symantec um, and we became part of Symantec. Continue to work on the same uh, product, which is basically uh, you buy it as a, as a company and you install it on your gateway. They can look for suspicious traffic coming into your network. So continue to work on that. And then I decided to uh, move on to the next thing and go look for Palm. If you remember like the Palm Trio or the Palm Pilot. So I worked on the Palm Trio smartphone. I had a Palm Pre for a little while. Did you really? So I did. Cool. I did. Yeah. 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 So that was that was pretty cool to work on. I think I was actually using a Trio smartphone at the time that I started there. Yeah. So I was working <laughs> on the same product that I was using. So yeah. that would have been what, 04? Uh, yeah. Yeah. This was 04 uh, when I went over to Palm. So, yeah. Um, and this was, of course, pre-iPhone. And the BlackBerry was kind of the big dog at the time. But Palm was making some gains in the market. So. Um, I really enjoyed that. I uh, got to have, make an impact on, the, on a pretty popular product. So did that for a while. Then I heard this rumor that Apple was making a phone. I said, that can't be true. Apple doesn't make phones. <laughs> so I go to their website, look at their recruiting uh, section. And sure enough, they're recruiting for uh, phone engineers, which I was at the time. So I went ahead and threw in my application. Uh, I didn't know anyone there. I just threw the application in online and got a call back because I kind of matched what they were looking for. And went through the process and ended up getting the offer at Apple. And uh, as uh, God's goodness would have it, literally, I think it was the same day that offer from Apple came in. My boss at Palm was calling us in one by one saying, would you like to go to China to teach them how to do your job? And I said, uh, no, but I got some news for you. <laughs> and, uh, I was going to go and do something. So, yeah, I went to work for Apple right before the first iPhone came out. Wow. And I was writing software to test the iPhone. And so I had probably... 
uh, I don't remember how many, seven, eight, ten, something like that, of these iPhones lined up in my office. And we also had one that we were supposed to carry and use as our phone to test it out, you know, in an everyday usage scenario, but under very high secrecy because it wasn't out yet. Yeah. And it was really, um, uh, there's really high secrecy around that. Steve Jobs himself had to approve everyone uh, that had one. So um, that was, that was pretty cool to be able to work on something like that. It was busy. You know, we worked a lot of weekends and things, but uh, we know that it made a pretty big difference. And they had takeout, so you could just go online and hit what you wanted and order it. Yeah. And that really made it quite uh, much more doable. Yeah. So a pretty ingenious thing, uh, I realized. Yeah. Having good food for folks and stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, but it was uh, it was uh, really meaningful to be able to work on that. What was so, Apple's company culture like at that point? Apple, I, I seem to notice... Uh, ran a tight ship compared to many other firms that I was familiar with or that my friends worked at. Uh, they're very good at hitting their deadlines. Uh, uh, they're very uh, disciplined in the way that they do the software development and testing. So I think it was a very well-run company. That was my first impression. Um, we worked more hours, and I think that people uh, worked at some other uh, firms. So uh, they made sure that you got the job done no matter what. So I think my overall impression is pr was pretty well run. Steve Jobs was all about the product. I mean, he was laser focused on that. He was very, very hands on. He filed bugs personally. We'd see the Steve Jobs bug come in and those are the priority bugs. <laughs> uh, sometimes it was a bug like, this orange is not really orange. This is off orange. I want to change it now. <laughs> yeah. So we had to spend a new build uh, to change the color and test it again and things. So yeah, it was, uh, Apple was well run and very product focused. That's my impression. I think I've decided that John is the coolest guy we've ever had on the show. <laughs> you have to, I did not even realize that you had done this much yeah. stuff. Yeah. So uh, tell us, you know, moving moving on from Apple, what did you what did you do after that? When did you leave? That sort of thing. So while I was at Apple, uh, there was this class at my church uh, called Perspectives, which was basically all about like Christian missions, yeah. um, evangelical missions. So I, I took that. It was once a week uh, class for, uh, I think, a couple of months. And I said, this is pretty cool stuff. I think I might want to get involved here. So I said, well, what could I do in terms of missions? Well, I already spoke Japanese because I studied in college and I studied abroad in Japan. And Japan is less than 1% Christian. So it's one of the least Christian countries in the world. So I decided, you know, after lots of research and checking out different organizations out there to uh, apply with the mission I went with called World Venture. And I ended up uh, leaving Apple and going to Japan uh, as a Christian missionary. And so I was there for, I want to say, seven years total. And because I can speak a language, I could do some uh, things that others couldn't, such as uh, presentations. Uh, so we did this thing called uh, Silicon Valley Nights, where we would uh, have it at church. And I'd talk about Silicon Valley innovation culture and compare and contrast with the Japanese business culture, which is a little bit more rigid in some ways. And the Japanese guys would love that because they don't get to hear that from someone who's actually been there very often. Mm -hmm. So that would bring them into a church, whereas normally they wouldn't uh, set foot in there because they don't really know what to expect and all that kind of stuff. So it was kind of a good way of bridging the church and the community. And the pastor would you know, sit in the crowd and uh, make friends with the guys. So uh, that was a pretty meaningful uh, I think, to be involved in just to kind of uh, be that bridge there. Yeah. Also did homeless outreach and, uh, and some other ministries. My uh, supervisor actually uh, does a ministry with gospel music, as it turns out, because the movie Sister Act went over to Japan and they all wanted to learn how to sing gospel. <laughs> and so he'd bring over American gospel singers a couple times a year, um, have these huge concerts with all these Japanese people singing gospel music and doing a pretty good job. Yeah. I mean, they're very studious and things, so they learn how to do it and stuff. So anyway, that's it's a very interesting uh, place as far as missions goes. But yeah, so did that for several years, but uh, kind of came to the realization that if, and this is when Obama was president, if the government's making things worse faster than the good guys are making things better, we kind of have a problem. We're on a sinking boat. So after uh, a lot of deliberation and getting advice from people, I decided to um, leave Japan and go and do my master's over at Harvard Kennedy School. Hardcore conservative bastion over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's funny. You may be the only good conservative that I know that's ever had a degree from the Kennedy School to the point where like it is a like rule of mine that I generally am skeptical of people who have gone to the Kennedy School. Yeah, I mean, I don't blame you. That, <laughs> that's not too inaccurate. Mm -hmm. uh, the Democrat caucus had probably 90 to 100 students in it. Mm -hmm. The GOP caucus maybe had eight, nine, 10. Mm -hmm. And of those, you had a lot of the, you know, some of the Romney type people and things like that. So the number of like the people that I would say are quote unquote like us, more of the new, next generation, more populist type people, very, very small, even among the small GOP community. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. So, I would say, though, that it was, there. I say, fun yeah. uh, to mix up with liberals. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them have shallow talking points, but if you go deep, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so for them, for example, racism means you disagree with my opinion. <laughs> but I will tell them my parents grew up in Alabama and had actual segregation and stuff. So tell me about what you, your thoughts on that yeah. and your experiences growing up in your environment on things like that. They really had nothing there. So um, another memory I have from Harvard is that we had a mock presidential debate in one of the classes I took, and I was one of the candidates. And the professor, who uh, kind of was left-leaning, uh, he goes, Gibbs, candidate Gibbs, what are you going to do about gun violence? We have a huge problem in this country. I said, here's what I'm going to do. I want every woman to have concealed carry <laughs> because I want every woman to be able to protect herself from rape, assault. Um, and uh, and so this is a critical issue if you want to protect women's lives. And frankly, if you disagree, I think you might be misogynist. So that's a serious <laughs> problem. And I'm actually kind of offended by that. Yeah. Yeah. And so he was like, OK. <laughs> but after class, a couple of folks came up to me and said, thank you for sharing that perspective. And these probably were not conservatives. Uh, they were just like regular folks. But so it just shows you the degree to which a lot of people have never even been exposed to what we believe. Uh, but I had fun just in moments like that, mixing mm -hmm. it up with them and, and things. So um, I definitely came out stronger in terms of my convictions mm -hmm. uh, and in that program. So what years were you at HKS? Uh, 15 and 16. 15, 16. It was a one year master's program for people that had some work experience already. Mm -hmm. So I did that a little bit later in life than most people do their master's. Gotcha. And so uh, 2016, not a very uh, significant year <laughs> yeah, in American politics. Year. Nothing so much is year. going on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what uh, what came next? <laughs> so. Um, I did a little bit of writing uh, for the Federalist. Um, I got to go on the Fox News lunch when uh, Tucker was still on five uh, Fox and Friends. Mm. So I went on on a Saturday morning and talked about voter fraud. Um, uh, who knows? Who knew how telling that would be? <laughs> yeah. But uh, so did that for a little bit. Uh, but turns out one of my friends who I met through the Harvard program worked for Dr. Carson. And so he called me one day after uh, Dr. Carson was appointed or nominated for HUD. And I said, dude, get me a job. <laughs> and so uh, he got me through the whole process and I began an administration in May of 17. Mm -hmm. So a few months after the beginning. Uh, so, yeah, I um, was there um, at HUD under Dr. Carson for, uh, yeah, just uh, all the way until the end. Started as a senior advisor in this uh, department called Community Planning and Development, which does homelessness money as well as economic development grants. Mm -hmm. um, and ended up uh, moving on from that and going up to the secretary's office working on some of the secretary's initiatives, such as uh, trying to do work requirements, family formation, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then right around the pandemic, um, uh, there's a staffing change made in the original department I started at, Community Planning and Development, or CPD for short, which I just mentioned. And there was a vacancy in the assistant secretary position. So a White House called me and said, would you like to do this? I said, uh, <coughs> yeah. Bless you. Uh, Thank you. I bless you. Um, and so... Literally the next day, <laughs> it was announced, and I think the day after, all my boxes were moved down there, and I was the acting assistant secretary for a community planning and development. So that's about $8 billion a year in the normal budget for, again, homelessness, community development, block grants, um, and about 700 employees that reported to me. And this was March 2020. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is the pandemic stuff was happening. And then I was actually moving that week as well from D.C. to um, Alexandria. <laughs> so all this stuff literally happened within one week. Yeah. So I'm, uh, you know, kind of keeping everything uh, from, uh, you know, organized as I was transitioning all this stuff. So it was good. And the first thing that happened was we got the CARES Act. Mm. So they said uh, nine billion dollars for your department, CPD. I said, well, I don't know. We need that necessarily. First of all, the best solution is get people back to work um, rather than just throwing money at stuff. And secondly, with all the money we give out every year on our regular budget, many communities have trouble spending that in the first place. Um, so why are we giving, you know, a, an amount greater than our entire annual budget on a one time appropriation? Maybe there's a better way of uh, getting people back to work and getting communities um, back to normal. And that was overridden. And the Congress did what they wanted to do. And they passed this. And so we got uh, the money. So uh, I just had to make sure it went out um, in an appropriate way. There's no shenanigans. It's not going to any um, groups like Planned Parenthood and things like that. So um, they wanted to use money to buy cell phones for Homeless. I said, I somehow didn't seem like a great idea. Um, so Obama phone too. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So, so, so we pushed back against those kind of things, and I actually had members of Congress asking us what was in the bill. So my staff and I were making powerpoints for the members, telling them what was in the bill that they passed. So that, that was a DC learning moment there. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. So uh, it's not very frequently that we get you know under former under secretaries on the assistant show, secretary. Uh, assistant secretary. Sorry. Um, but uh, I'm I I think for our listeners, you know what what is that? What is running an office like that like? Um, you know who's who's working directly under you? What kinds of 
authority do you have? What is that relationship with Congress like? I mean, give us give us an insight into what doing that is sure. like. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, so Congress passes the laws, obviously. But when a Congress passes a law, they don't get into all the specificity of how it's implemented. And they usually will say, you know, for example, for homelessness, <laughs> um, this year we're appropriating $2.2 billion for this homelessness program. Um, and it should be administered according to rules developed by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So then we write the rules for how the program is implemented with the money that Congress gave us. Those rules can do a lot. You have a lot of latitude, uh, but you can't, you know, go against an existing law or mm -hmm. against what the law says for that program. As long as you don't do that, you can have a lot of latitude in terms of how the money is used or not used. So uh, we do a lot of rulemaking on how those laws are to be implemented. And then there is something called guidance or sub-regulatory guidance, which is less complicated than rulemaking because you don't need a comment period or anything like that. You just put it out there saying, you know, here's how this program should be done. You can't do as much as with a rule, but uh, you can still have some direction. So that's kind of the biggest mission of, of HUD and many federal agencies is doing uh, rulemaking to implement and fill in the blanks, so to speak, um, on the laws that the that Congress passes. Now, many folks believe that there's too much power in the agencies uh, to do this kind of thing, um, which there may be some merit to that. Uh, there was the, uh, was, I forgot the name of the, the court case on this, um, uh, something preference, Chevron preference. Chevron difference. Yeah, difference, yeah. So the, I know there's a debate about that, but the way it is now, um, that's how it works. So um, I would say that's the primary function. Uh, as far as, like, for example, my department, HUD has, you know, um, a public and Indian housing. They do Section 8 and public housing. So that's what most people are familiar with. That's probably half of HUD's overall budget. Uh, we don't have as much money as them in, in CPD, Community Planning and Development, but we do, again, do the homelessness and uh, grants to uh, states and counties. And I had, you have uh, under an assistant secretary, at least at HUD and some other agencies, it's not like this at all agencies. I have uh, deputy assistant secretaries, which handle different areas. So you have one that may do homelessness, one that may do grants, one that may do other programs, not in those two categories. And they are the ones that I interface with a lot. Um, those could be careers or it could be politicals. Um, but I interface with a lot of the careers who had been there for a while. And most of them, I think, were uh, pretty solid in terms of, um, you know, uh, respecting the hierarchy and doing what they're asked to do. So I think in, in the vast majority of cases, uh, it was it was relatively smooth. You do have a few outliers who um, may be activists um that are sometimes difficult to deal with and they may talk to the media they may talk to the congressional committees and try to undermine what we're doing that happened on several occasions so that's um, something that's a bit tricky um it can be tough to um to move or uh, an employee and things so it takes a lot to do um uh, and uh it's just it's really quite a, an environment for better and worse in some ways in terms of managing uh, uh, uh employees who cannot be fired and, who, and you have very little leverage there, but that wasn't necessary in most cases again, but there's a there's few out there who are really um, activists in their mentality, yeah. so that's that's a challenge. What was the thing you tried to do or that, you know, Secretary Carson asked you to do that most, you know, raised their hackles? What what was the the red line that, that no one's allowed to go over uh, in terms of the policy that you pr uh, proposed there? Sure, so under Obama, there is a, this ideology in homelessness programs that what you should do is just give everybody free housing, unlimited free housing, no time limit, no requirements, no nothing. Um, and that's how you solve homelessness. Well, they started doing this and it didn't work. Numbers kept going up and up and up. Wow, imagine that. <laughs> uh, just giving people free stuff. So the problem with it, obviously, is you're not getting to the heart of what's wrong with the person. You're not getting to, is there, is there substance abuse going on? Is there mental issues that need to be treated going on? Is there counseling so the person can restore their relationships and be able to get a job and things? It, it, it moves the focus from that, which is what really gets a person out of homelessness, to simply giving them a roof over their head, which if you just do that, now they might just use it for to, for hoarding or as you know for other uh, nefarious purposes. And they may even still live on the street, but it's just use that place to store their stuff or something. So the issues are still there and you haven't really helped the person just by putting a roof over their head. So I try to push back against that. And we try to say, look, if we're giving out this money to organizations that are using it, we want them to actually deal with what's wrong with the person. We want them to have treatment programs and things. Oh, no, it's like you're trying to kill puppies and kittens. You can't have that. <laughs> no, you just have to get them free housing. If not, you have no heart. How dare you want to force someone to receive drug treatment or receive counseling? That's so mean. Oh. So they go behind my back and I talk to the liberal groups, the media, and some of the congressional committees, and they drink the Kool-Aid. So for the first time ever, we get language in our annual appropriation saying I can't change that program. They're saying you've got to keep the same rules and guidance 
as was under the um, Obama uh, yeah. uh, plan to just give them free stuff forever. So as far as I know, they haven't done that before. And that was a pretty big blow. And some of our own people um, on the Hill uh, drank the Kool-Aid and really could have helped us with that, but did not. Yeah. So I would say that's the biggest issue where they really were afraid that their um, their scheme was going to um, come undone and and uh, move over against us. Can you explain a little bit about, I, I, I know that this was a big narrative during the Obama administration, how some of these agencies and the massive amounts, the funds they control are often used to just funnel government funds to these very hard lefty groups. I mean, ACORN was always the classic story about this. What are the other ways that HUD is used at an institutional level to advance the interests of the left? Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of grants that go out as well. And it can be difficult to track where it's going ultimately because a lot of it is self-reporting um, from the grantee and they do have to submit their receipts if we ask for it. But this is one of the big initiatives we try to do is get more transparency on where the money's going. I wanted to get to the point where if you're an American citizen, you plug in your zip code and you can see where the money is going down to multiple levels because it comes from HUD, for example, to your county. The county then gives it to, say, a nonprofit group that's doing homelessness. That group then can, can then give it to someone else. So we want to be able to see as much as possible where that money is going and, um, and who's getting it. That's something I got a little bit of pushback on um, because the transparency uh, uh, makes some people a bit nervous. Um, and I, I, we were making progress on that uh, uh, and getting transparency. You have to bring some of the staff along. They're willing to do it as long as you know that you're not necessarily trying to attack them per se. You're trying to get transparency to the American people. So there's a communications issue and a, you know, a human issue of how do you deal with people like that? But we were going in the right direction on that for sure. But there is a big problem with a lot of these grants in terms of lack of transparency. Now, the interesting thing is the law actually requires uh, that transparency. There's laws in the books that say you've got to use this reporting system to say where the money's going. It's just that people ignore it and there's no teeth to it. So there's no consequences if you don't do it. So getting that thing actually filled in and making sure people are following it, maybe getting Congress to put some more teeth on it so that there's actual penalties would be a very good thing. But here's another quirk, though. You look at one of our programs, such as a community development block grant, for which this is an absolute issue. Well, both parties love it and they like the way it is now because it may go to one of their donors or something. And so they don't want the heat coming down on their donors telling them, you know, you can't use it for this, can't use it for that. So there's not a lot of support on the Hill for transparency and grants. So we're sitting there trying to do it at the rulemaking level, perhaps, but then they'll go behind our back and talk to the Hill and say, hey, look what they're doing. The Hill will not have our back likely because this is going to hurt the, the flow of the money that they really enjoy. So it creates a dynamic where we're almost against the Hill and doing something like this. Um, now, there's some there's still things we can do, but uh, that's just one of the difficulties there. But, yeah, it is it is a persistent challenge. What did you learn about the relationship between executive agencies and Capitol Hill? Obviously, you know, you, you laid out the anecdote about having to give presentations about the bill they passed to sure. members of Congress. That's yeah. that kind of gives the game away. But but tell us more about how degenerated that that relationship is, because it's it's almost a normie conservative talking point at this point. Oh, you know, Congress doesn't actually know what it's doing anymore. And that's, that's true. And I'm sure that you had, you know, a unique insight into that. Well, it's um. The way our political system works, it causes the kind of problems sometimes because the CARES Act bill, I want to say, was like, uh, was it 55,000 something pages? Um, I forgot the exact number. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you wonder if every member voting on this has actually read it. The answer is obviously no. Then you have to wonder who's writing it. Um, the, the committees have a lot of power. The staff and the committees have a lot of power. And they also have relationships with the industry groups as well. So you got to wonder, you know, who's writing these bills? Is it like coming from the politicians or the staff, or is it sometimes coming from the industry as well? Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of one of the really big issues is that the interests have the upper hand in this um, and are driving the whole process. And what gets passed may be beneficial to that interest, but harmful to the overall American population. So that's kind of the underlying dynamic you're dealing with. Another one is that uh, Senate confirmed positions obviously must be confirmed by the whole Senate, obviously, by the committee before that. And you better believe the industry has very good relationships with the Senate committees, such that if any person was nominated who might actually change the system or who would not play ball in the way that they imagine playing ball, you will not make it through your committee hearing and likely also a full Senate vote either. This creates a system where the people that are confirmed by the Senate are uh, usually only people, not always, but mostly, who are going to play ball with the existing system. So then you have a case where if you're underneath such a person, 
um, as a political appointee, then you've got trouble because you're going to have conflict if you wanted to change something and the person above you uh, was coming from the ministry before they did this and are going back after they are doing this. They don't want to rock the boat. So you have that dynamic as well. So because of the way our system works like that, where the interest groups donate to the politicians on the committees and they can tell them, therefore, by virtue of that, thumbs up and thumbs down, it makes change really difficult. Was the position that you were supposed to be acting or was the acting assistant secretary position supposed to be Senate confirmed? It was, yes. OK. Um, however, because I was nominated for OPM director, we didn't go for that position. We went for OPM director. But, yeah, the Presidential Vacancies Act dictates how long you can serve as an acting in an assistant secretary position. So I think it was like 210 days or something like that. I don't remember the exact number, but yeah, it is a Senate confirmed position. And for the, all the reasons I mentioned, yeah, the same dynamic, you know, if you get someone in there who can be confirmed, uh, they may not be that great in terms of reform. If you get someone who's reform minded, then they may be blocked um, uh, by the committee because of the industry's pressure. So it's a, it's a tough one. So as someone who spent, you know, almost the entire Trump administration, you know, working in the administration, what are some things that you would recommend to, to future administrations as to how to combat some of these problems that you've been you've been talking about? I would say, for example, if you're talking about a Trump type administration, uh, which is reform minded or whoever it might be in the future, that's more of a populist type mentality. You got to make sure that every single appointee is on board with that agenda. If you're putting people in positions of leadership as appointees who are more of the um, old school type, uh, just lower taxes, and that's the only thing we need to do, type people, for example, you're going to have a big uh, trouble because they can, they, they will ignore what the president wants to do and they'll have their own agenda. And uh, it may be hard to have accountability against such individuals. So I would say number one thing, um, make sure that all of your appointees are on board. Mm -hmm. uh, two, uh, make sure that you have people who understand the rulemaking process. You know, you, you draft the rule, then it has to go through public comment. And all the liberal groups and the industry groups are going to flood the comments. That's what they do. And then after you get the comments, you have to. John Oliver might comments. do a segment. And yeah. Have yeah. Everyone yeah. Flood his. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And so uh, they're going to do that. So you got to have a strategy to respond to that and still get your, your rule through. So um, understanding the rulemaking process is important. Then I would say having good membership, good relationships with the good members of Congress, because mm -hmm. there are some folks out there on whatever issue might be, for example, housing for us that are actually favorable and do understand what to do. So having a really good relationship with them is good, as well as having a good press shop to have good relationships with the media to get mm -hmm. our side of the story out there, um, which is something that often gets overlooked. So, um, yeah, having those relationships, uh, learning how the rulemaking process works, making sure you bring in people who are truly aligned and want to do the agenda. Um, and then uh, being creative, uh, mm -hmm. being willing to do things a different way than they've been done before, being willing to move around certain employees. If you have a career employee who's not playing ball, um, you know, being able to move them around. Will they accuse you of you know something if you try to do that? Probably. Um, but uh, if you have to do that, then you need to be able to do that. So, yeah, I would say those are some. some things. Yeah, I'm sure you're you know going to have um, a bit of a unique experience. Uh, you know, you're running for Congress right now, and there there are not many members of Congress who have who have uh, you know served very high up in different departments um, and and that sort of thing. So, what you know, if you if you are elected and you are a member of Congress, how are you? going to want to kind of change the relationship that exists between Congress and, and the different agencies and departments, both in an unfriendly presidential administration, but maybe in a more friendly one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, the first thing is just have a good relationship with them. Um, so having regular meetings in contact with both the principal, as well as even some of the uh, assistant secretaries or even deputy assistant secretaries, um, whether it's the member or at the staff level is pretty important. No matter whether the administration is on our side or not, I think you have to have those channels open. So I think that's one thing. Um, the second thing is being based on actual data. Now, there is always a battle over, you know, what is real science and fake yeah. science and real data is yeah. fake data. But I don't want to give up real science and real data. I, I want to still fight for that. Um, for example, randomized controlled trials, we know, are the gold standard for how you prove that something works. Um, so I think we, we can't abandon that. Mm -hmm. So basing things on actual data is a good way to <clears throat> keep the naysayers at bay because they're not coming in saying, uh, you liberals are just trying to do the socialist program, which is probably factually true. <laughs> but you can instead <laughs> say, here's five randomized controlled trials I have. These are peer reviewed studies. They show that the approach that you're recommending actually does not work and in fact reduces self-sufficiency. 
That's why we have to be against this. We want to follow the science. This is what the science says. Mm-hmm. Uh, they want to hem and haul on that or try to bring their own stuff, then we'll talk about it. But I think starting with things that are objective based on data and science and real science, I think it's worth fighting for. So um, I think conversations should be based on that. Um, and then, yeah, uh, lawmakers, I think, in some ways have ceded too much power to the agencies in terms of the implementation of these programs. Mm-hmm. So in some cases, we may want the lawmakers to actually be more specific in their directions on how the programs to be done. Um, to take some of that power away from the agencies and put it back into the legislative branch because you can always elect a new person, but a career employee basically cannot be fired. So you're creating an environment where literally some of these programs, no matter who you elect, can never be changed if the person in charge of it is an entrenched career and the political appointee above them doesn't know enough or doesn't have the support for whatever reason to be able to come down on that person to change it. You have a lot of cases like that where the programs never change no matter who's in office. So I think in some cases, the Congress does ne- does need to take more of a uh, leadership position in defining these programs and sometimes a little bit less from the agencies. Not all cases, but in some, I think it is appropriate. Mm. You mentioned earlier uh, reform minded, maybe a, a newer way of thinking about, you know, what the conservative movement should stand for, what the Republican Party should stand for um, in the issues that you worked on in the administration, specifically HUD. I mean, you know cutting back some of these programs, work requirements, some of these things, you know, they've been sort of conservative orthodoxy for some time in this issue area that you now have some level of expertise in. What do you think the the specific newer angle that that people of our persuasion uh, should be taking that maybe differs from from the existing consensus a little bit? What are the, the opportunities there? Sure. I mean, I would say very emphatically, families, families, families. If you are a young family in your 20s or 30s and you want to buy a house, it costs, um, last time I checked, I think it was three times more um, relative to your income than 1980. Wow. So when someone who bought a house in 1980 complains that these young people aren't buying houses, they're ignoring the data because a house today is so much more expensive compared to your income than it was in 1980. Yeah. Believe Nick, me. Your house? <laughs> yeah, believe me, I know. We've yeah. we've been trying, me and my wife have been trying to buy a house now for like nine months, like since before we got married. And right. it's like still just put in offers and all these boomers are outbidding me because they just have <laughs> bottomless wealth. I mean, it's sure. it's ridiculous. Either that or like Saudi Prince or something. Or BlackRock, you know, yeah. bought sure. the house that we wanted, yeah. you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and this points to the problem that American housing policy is basically designed to keep prices always going up no matter what. Mm-hmm. If you're the local county government, you get your assessments on property taxes, you want that. If you're an existing homeowner, you want that. Um, the people that have the most political pull um, want that. And so that's how our housing policy is right now. Um, but I think if we look at families and think about what's best for families, we can make some changes to that if we message it that way. So I would say, uh, that's an issue that doesn't get talked about nearly enough. I would even go so far as to say there could be an initiative, you know, Mm -hmm. an administration saying, you know, um, housing for families or focusing on families first or family first, something like that. where you are focusing on this whole issue of making it easier for, uh, normal families to be able to uh, afford housing. So mm. that's one thing. You could also have even an, I don't know what one might call it, America First or whatnot. China buys up a lot of land here. You have firms like BlackRock and many other ones mm. besides them that just go around buying up land, buying up housing. You have to think about justice um, and whether or not that is a just thing to do when a regular American can't buy a house, but billion dollar firms are going up and buying up places. Some might argue, and I think I might agree that that's somewhat unjust. Uh, because the government's supposed to work for the vast bulk of the people, not just a small number of people who control a lot of the money. By the way, Singapore does this. Yeah. When I was at HUD, I looked at their housing policy. They're actually not bad. Yeah. They don't allow the foreigners to come in there and buy up stuff. Canada, and- like Justin Trudeau, when he was running for re-election a couple of months ago, had to make a plank of his platform taken from the right-wing parties that he would curtail, I think it was specifically Chinese and Middle yes. Easterners, mm-hmm. from buying up canadian housing because they're Absolutely having right. a big problem like Absolutely. even you know fruity justin trudeau has yeah. had to like see yeah. see the light on this issue yeah and singapore you know they allow the kind of housing market that we have china will come in there and buy up every single available place within milliseconds so yeah. they don't allow it and they require a larger down payment and you have to be a married couple in order to get certain types of loans uh-huh. so they have a pro-family policy and all the scientific data doesn't matter what party one belongs to shows that kids raised in married two-parent families have better outcomes mm-hmm. that's a very smart policy they have over there but we don't have anything like those we kind of have a free-for-all where china or whoever it might be or blackrock can come in and just buy up all this stuff so i think an america first or americans first um, type policy could be uh, very helpful for people of our persuasion 
Now, a lot of Americans support this. I would bet you that the polling is very good. Mm -hmm. But again, you're up against this money machine where the folks that have the resources to buy up all this housing also have resources to buy up the politicians, too. Yeah. And so you have an uphill battle there. But the people are with us. So there's this mm -hmm. question of how do we translate public support for these kind of initiatives and get that to the political level so the politicians have to do it whether they want to or not. It's very hard for me to, like, think about where to go next because you're an expert on, like, so many things. But uh, I... I I'm curious to hear about, you know, you brought up families and family formation a lot. Um, what what parts of, of family formation, I mean, aside from just housing, so more like the, the urban development side of things, does does HUD touch? Um, how how does, you know, having a home, um, how does that play into people having families and getting married and, and that sort of thing? So you bring up a good question. I mean, this is this is amazing. They're always talking about, oh, the black home ownership rates. It hasn't gone up. Oh, we need a program. We need more spending. And so I went to a meeting with a congressional black caucus on this. And it was the other going on and on. I said, uh, thank you. you know, respectfully, there's something you haven't actually talked about. Marriage. The black marriage rate has dropped like a rock since the 1960s. And married people are way more likely to buy a house than single people. So if you get the marriage rate up, you get more black home ownership. What do you think about that? Uh, well, uh, well uh, we want to respect all, all family types and the modern families and stuff. So uh, we don't know if we want to go there and then move on to the next thing immediately. So, yeah, um, they always want to talk about um, disparities in home ownership without even talking about the core thing, which is marriage. And realizing that if you increase marriage, you're going to increase home ownership rates, especially among disadvantaged groups. So that's one huge impact. Another one, and this problem is this, unfortunately, across almost the entire benefits regime of the U.S. and state governments, is we actually pay for broken families. Mm -hmm. So the a person chooses to have uh, children without being married to the father, for example, then you actually get more benefits per child that you have. And so we actually are financing a type of family unit that is dangerous to the child. You know, a kid raised in a single parent home, especially if the boyfriend lives there, you have something like a 10 times higher chance of physical abuse, 19 times higher chance of sexual abuse when compared to a kid raised in a family of two married parents. Mm -hmm. That means we're literally paying for kids to be abused in a certain manner of speaking because we finance um, these kind of uh, family types. So I think certain countries out there are doing a good job on trying to actually um, give benefits to couples that are married um, and maybe not uh, finance uh, those situations which are dangerous for kids. Um, so I think that's something we can do as well. And right now we do the opposite. Um, we looked at doing something like that where you, uh, their marriage penalties, basically, if you're getting your, if you're on benefits, your income's here, the threshold's here. So if you make more than that, you don't get benefits anymore. Well, you get married, you go up here because you got more income coming in. Now you lose your benefits. This actually creates a disincentive to marriage. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to deal with this problem. Um, there are many different approaches you could take, but um, we got to find a way to make it so that these disincentives are gone and that you can actually incentivize marriage for everybody, but especially among those who are poor, it is one of the top ways out of poverty and to make sure your kid is not poor is to raise that kid in the married two parent home. So yeah, our whole benefit system, including the HUD section eight and whatnot, it does the opposite, sadly. When it comes to housing policy and, and the rising cost of home ownership, the neoliberals have an answer to this, which is just density, density, yes, density, density. That's right. um, tell us how you think about that question and what were some of the fights related to that, uh, specifically something called AFFH um, that uh, uh, one of our mutual friends, James, recommended we, we talk about for this show. To tell us how you think about the question of density. Yeah, I mean, you look at, you know, the solutions coming out of there from many of the more libertarian minded folks. And it says, build, 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 build more housing, have more density. Um, I I think that's a little bit problematic because one, it's a one size fits all type solution. Two, what is the American character? Isn't the American character you have your home with a green grass and your picket fence around it? We're not Hong Kong where you want everybody to live in a hundred uh, story uh, building and you just have your whole your apartment your whole life. I think part of the American character and the American story is that you do have your own place and you do have a yard for your kids to run around in and things like that. So. That, for me, is one of the most problematic aspects of the desire to just increase density as the one solution to everything. The other problem with that is, you know, there's a supply and demand issue here, obviously. So they're saying increase supply, but I'm saying what about demand? So there are many factors that drive uh, demand in housing, such as um, artificial uh, manipulation of interest rates. Um, you know, we have uh, immigration plays into this. Uh, because it causes population growth that uh, puts a lot of pressure on housing. So we have to look at the numbers that we're bringing in. Especially because it's immigration, you know, uh, 
natural population growth usually happens inversely correlated to existing population density. People in rural areas sure. tend to have more kids than people in urban yeah, areas. Absolutely. Immigration happens in direct correlation to existing population right. density. So people go to places where there are already mm -hmm. lots of people. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So if you think about, um, I forgot there's a group out there. I think it was called, um, uh, I forgot, I can't remember the name. Of the group. They calculated that we'll need to build um, uh, something like, uh, I forgot the number of tens of millions of housing units over the next decade, just to house the people that we are bringing in. Um, and so no one thinks about this. People just say, hey, we just, you know, have our current immigration policy and everything has pluses and minuses, everything in life. So it's incumbent upon us to think about this, but the lawmakers often don't even consider the impact on housing of who we bring in, the numbers that we bring in. So that's one aspect of it as well. Um, so there are lots of demand drivers of housing, lots of policies that uh, drive demand. We've got to look at those too, not just as this one size fits all solution of um, increase supply, increase supply, increase density. Also, there's a problem of overriding local control. Local control is a core American principle. If a local community decides they don't want more density, that's their choice. They're the ones who actually live there. You know, they've got to have the say in that. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the state or the federal government coming in there with a heavy hand saying, we're going to force density in your community, even though the people in the community don't want it. So, um, uh, so I guess that's federalism, uh, but even more so than that, just real getting it down to was uh, fractal localism is what Talib would call it. But mm -hmm. I think it re really got to obey that principle. So, yeah, and the FFH was basically this huge, heavy-handed approach by the Obama administration, where they uh, they have this application that's like hundreds of pages, where you have to fill in all the details of your community and your racial composition here, and they'll then determine if you're racist because you don't have enough housing uh, for um, certain uh, groups. And then they can make you build it or then they will penalize you and try to take away your money. I mean, what are we, Soviet Union? I mean, this is just amazing that this could <laughs> yeah. be allowed to happen in America. But they actually did this. And it took a real fight to roll that back because um, certain people out there um, are sometimes a fan of this density approach or they want to appear to virtual signal to the media and the overall population saying, oh, we're compassionate, we, we want more. Uh, diversity in the communities and without realizing that doesn't even achieve our goal first of all second it's based on force which is um, a violation of of doing what's right um various other reasons but yeah so that policy was terrible and it took uh, quite a fight to to get rid of it so and i believe that they're trying to bring it back now um wow. with the Biden folks but if uh if more um level-headed people get in there again we've got to take that down and uh focus on um, the real factors. Minus. Have you taken a look at who has your job in HUD now? <laughs> um, I have, uh, as of a little while ago. Um, I don't know specifically about uh, how they're doing over there. I mean, I know they're going back to driving some of the Obama era stuff. I've heard that. Uh, I've heard overall at many agencies that uh, a lot of these guys with Biden thought that we were so terrible that they could just come in there and they'd automatically be better than us just by virtue of sitting in their seat. And now they're learning the hard way that governing actually is difficult. <laughs> and some of their careers are saying that they've never seen this level of this organization. Really? I've heard that feedback at some of the agencies. So um, I think they're hopefully learning to grow up um, and actually govern. But it doesn't look like they are based on what we're seeing in yeah. every policy area, no matter what it is. It's a total disaster. It, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think you, br you bring up a very interesting point, you know, when you were talking about the American dream, like having a white picket fence um, and that – Many Americans like that's what they that's what they want. They want to live in the in the suburbs. They want to have, you know, a nice house with a yard. Um, you see a lot of people on on, you know, Twitter talking about um, urban city planning. You know, many people have many opinions about, you know, where you should be living and what neighborhoods should look like. I'm just wondering, like, what do you think about the suburbs? Are you pro suburbs? Are you anti suburbs? You know, let's talk about how you plan a town. Um. I guess I'm pro choice only when it comes to housing. <laughs> um, and in this Hope nobody era, cuts that into a I know, right? Yeah. Right. An abortion, I'm 100% pro life in all cases. But when it comes to housing like this and urban planning, if someone wants to live uh, in, a, in a rural area where they have their own farm, we should have a uh, supply for that. If someone wants to live in the suburbs with a yard and things so their kids can run around, they can have a shed in the back and, you know, have their uh, suburban life, we should have that available too. And if someone wants to live in an urban area, uh, you know, and they like walkability and they they are OK living in a condo or something because they like being downtown near where everything's at. They should have that as an option, too. I think we should have a variety of choices for what people want. Um, I Housing think, pluralism. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like when you buy a car, you can buy a Honda Civic or you can buy a Cadillac Escalade or you can buy anything in between. You know, there's yeah. choice. 
I think a lot of our policy on housing has removed that kind of choice and only allowed certain things. So I think there has to be choice there. And I don't like the idea of people out there saying, oh, everything's got to be uh, high density. Everything's got to be this. I think, uh, yeah. So so what are some of the unique challenges we're experiencing with supply and cost between those three specifically? You know, you mentioned um, if you want to have a farm, if you want to live in a rural area, if you want to live in a suburb or if you want to live in a city, are they all increasing in price and, and, you know, how hard it is to get one at the same time? Is there more of a supply in one than the other? Like, can you compare and contrast those? Yeah, for example, like now compared to 1980, I want to say there's something like 2 million fewer units of low cost apartments than there is today. Hmm. Uh, well, today we have 2 million fewer than there was back then. Yeah. Um, because what they're doing is if you have an apartment that is low cost, it's not going to be the nicest thing in the world. It might be a little bit older. It's livable. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reason it's cheap is because it's a little bit older. But what they're saying is, no, uh, we don't want to have uh, that kind of stuff. We want to bulldoze that and spend money subsidizing the building of brand new apartments that are much more expensive. Mm-hmm. Well, the result of that is you've now pulverized all your low cost supply and replaced it with luxury apartments. Um, and by the way, one reason that apartments become luxury is because if you're luxury, you don't have to accept Section 8. Mm-hmm. So when the cities and states say you must accept Section 8, which some do, um, one way that developers get around that is by making everything luxury. Mm-hmm. So they're actually hurting uh, people by making them pay more rent in order to get around these mandates. Um, so it's, it's it's pretty crazy. But yeah, so there's this policy of when you subsidize the builders to go in and build stuff, it does typically make things more expensive, contrary to what most people think. Oh, we need to spend more on housing, not housing. But actually, spending more tends to make it more expensive. Mm. So you see that policy. Another one you see is um, a lot of areas are buying into this rhetoric. So instead of building single family homes, they're now building, say, uh, condos or um, uh, apartments, um, even in these uh, suburban areas or semi rural areas, Mm -hmm. because they bought into this whole argument that you have to have more density. And that is a decision made by, I guess, the developer as well as the local government. Uh, So there's that mentality that needs to be a challenge as well. You know, they want to have that, okay, build it maybe uh, somewhere else or build only a certain amount, but also build a single family for those who want single family, make sure there's the right balance of that. So um, that's one issue. Um, and then, of course, there's firms buying up all this land. So if you want to buy your own 10-acre plot and build your own house on it, if there is some billionaire firm in New York City buying up all the available land, yeah. then that's not going to be available for regular Americans who wanted to buy that property and build something on it. Yeah. And we just allow that blatantly, which is, is quite surprising. So Yeah, we've... We have some personal experience with that. We've been yeah. we've been trying to buy uh, about ten acres of land, and yeah. it's even just the way the price has gone up over the last nine months. And yeah. and the more you've been hearing about, you know, large multinational corporations buying it all up. I mean, it's yeah. it's nuts. It's terrifying. Yeah. Um, so, in the last year, the. Trump administration, you transitioned from uh, sort of squarely being inside the HUD world of things to potentially looking at the whole of government. You were nominated to the um, to to run the Office of Personnel Management. Um, tell us what that is. We've had on uh, Patrick Witt before, who is sure. the deputy chief of staff there. But tell us a little bit about what OPM is, um, what that process of being selected for it was like and, and what the hope was uh, of what you'd be able to do there. Sure. So OPM is the um, Office of Personnel Management. It's basically the federal government's HR wing. So they manage um, the policies for the millions of federal employees, such as uh, how do you pick your health care plan, your retirement plan, um, policies for how do you hire and fire an employee, uh, et cetera. And so I was nominated by President Trump to be director of OPM. So, um, you know, I got all prepared for that. I was doing my studying, I was doing my murder boards, as we call it, where you practice your hearing with um, OPM employees and they pretend they're the senators and on your committee. And so we went through that and then had my actual committee hearing and the committee has 15 people on it, eight Republicans, seven Democrats. And as fate would have it, one of those Republicans was one of our very favorites, Mitt Romney. Oh boy. <laughs> and um, he was pretty much uh, bent on not allowing Trump people to go through, including myself. Even though he marched on Black Lives Matter parade, and so shouldn't he support me? He Black Lives Matter. <laughs> oh, but anyway, so um, uh, it was a bit, very unfortunate. So you, uh, you know, unfortunately, the clock ran out on on OPM, and um, you know, you found yourself um, looking for your for your next thing right after the administration. Well, what did you decide to do, John? And uh, and tell us a little bit about how that's going. Sure. So we had our involuntary change of employment, <laughs> um, and. Uh, when was your resignation effective? 12 or 1201? Or how does that work? Uh, 12 noon on January 20th. Okay. Yeah. We had to all write a letter and send it in and stuff. And 
So a little bit sad, but you know, it is what it is. So yeah, I just, I decided to maybe take a little bit of a break and then probably stay in DC and work for a think tank or something and uh, not be in the media spotlight as much and yeah. kind of be more of a normal person again. So it's kind of planning to do that. Uh, then, um, end of January, 2021 rolls around this newly elected congressman in Michigan named Peter Meyer becomes one of only 10 Republicans to vote to impeach Trump. Uh, some of our, uh, some friends of mine who, uh, you know, from our administration, uh, called me and kind of suggested, Hey, you should go back to Michigan since you're from there and, uh, take a run against this, this Peter Meyer guy. And I said, okay, let me think about it. You know? And so I thought about it for a bit and deliberated and said, okay, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. So I uh, got my ducks lined up in a row and uh, announced, and now we're up and running and uh, uh, in uh, the third congressional district in West Michigan, and uh, hopefully going to primary the Peter Meyer guy and then primary the communist in November. <laughs> What's your read of where the Republican base is right now? What are they caring about? What 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 are the issues that animate them? Or, you know, it, the people in this town would love it to be the case that everything Trump stood for is now gone because he's no longer president and we can go back to the good old yes. days. Uh, are these guys pining for a, a, a Bush style republicanism? Tell us what, what you're seeing. I mean, there is a huge energy among the base. It's like it's boiling under the surface. People are really sick of of everything that's been happening, like the lockdowns. Mm. Their kids can't go to school. Even when their kids go to school, they force them to wear a mask, even though the parents don't want to get to wear a mask. Um, you have this critical race theory stuff. The government is calling you a domestic terrorist if you show up to your school board meeting. Gas prices are high, empty shelves, et cetera. So people are sick of this stuff, and the energy level is increasing. And I think more and more of the base across the country is realizing that both parties are somewhat responsible for this. And so they're not just looking at the label anymore. They're looking at who the person actually is. So I see more of that. Um, in my district, uh, it's not just that Meyer voted to impeach Trump. He also, for example, voted from the omnibus uh, recently, which has some very problematic things in it. He's voted for amnesty. Um, uh, so people look at that and they say, this person is part of the machine. He's not really for us. And I think you're seeing that sentiment rising. I think um, in Michigan, there's a huge groundswell and momentum around uh parental choice um, around the whole lockdown thing that has developed and it's, it's still there and it still has a lot of energy. And I think people are getting activated like never before to go after your school board and run for a school board, uh, run for county commission, run for township commission, whatever it might be. I think we're seeing a lot of good activity there. So um, all that stuff uh, runs counter to what the establishment and the GOP typically has stood for in the way they've typically operated. So there is a lot of tension I'm seeing as well. I mean, I've seen shouting at some of the meetings between the <laughs> establishment and the grassroots. I mean, it, it's really it's really increasing. And we're supposed to be a representative democracy. But if the people in our party are not being represented by the leadership of our party, which is kind of where we've been at and the situation we have, then that's a little bit of a problem. So um, hopefully we'll be seeing a realignment over the coming years where we can mm. get um, more actual representation. So, yeah, but I'm seeing among the grassroots um uh, people are really fed up and they really are wanting to support those who actually represent who they are. You've had a very interesting career. I mean, you've done so many things. What are uh, what are some of the things you're bringing from from your past experience, you know, at Palm, at Apple in Japan? Like what are, what are some really just interesting areas that that not a lot of members of Congress are talking about that that you're very interested in talking about with the people that live in, in your district? Sure. I would say um, uh, starting in the beginning, you know, Silicon Valley, software engineering, et cetera. Like, how do you actually build something? Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure that you build something that works and how do you test it to make sure it works? Um, uh, I think those are important concepts that many people, especially in the political realm, take for granted, mm -hmm. uh, especially if they've never actually worked on something where they have to build things that work and they get paid for that. I think um, many folks don't really understand this concept. So it becomes all about like feelings. Well, we've passed a you know, an increase in 25% of this homelessness program, we're putting more money out there. Well, does it actually work? Well, that question is not as important because you're a good person because you increase spending to help people. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where it ends. So I think um, any job where you actually learn how to build things, and that could be whether you're in construction or software engineering, whatever it might be, I think is useful. So that's something to bring to bear. My time in Japan, you know, there's this word in missions called contextualization, which means that when you share the message of the gospel or the Bible, you always do it in a way that the other person understands, not in the way that I want to communicate it. And I think that's, of course, very valuable in politics. And I think, again, I think our party has sometimes not been very good at that, which is why you look at a uh, George W., a Romney and McCain, 
who lost to Michigan by double digits, whereas Trump comes in there and wins it. Um, and I think that the reason he did do that precisely because of conceptualization. He communicates mm. in a way that the people um, resonate with um, and the issues that people care about, not just saying, we can lower taxes, we can you know, reduce, uh, increase profits by 0.43%. If we outsource to China, then we will increase our profit margin by 3.67%. And clearly, this is, this is optimal because- Computer chips, potato chips in Paris, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So um, that's important. And then um, being in the administration, of course, you see how the DC machine works up front and uh, up close and personal. That, that's the executive branch. It's not legislative, but we interface with legislative a lot. And that's also the same government overall. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the experiences I had are very instructive. And uh, and even in reading statutes and knowing what, it, what it's talking about. Um, yeah, because uh, you had to get better at reading legislation than Congress when you were yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because the, the the kind of revolution in some ways that President Trump started in 2015-16, um, specifically on the concrete policy issues, I would say that there was kind of four, uh, you know, immigration, economic nationalism, foreign policy realism, and then just actually fighting the cultural enemies of the right. Um, yeah. They didn't really have a lot of congression, a new congressional champions over the course of his presidency. It didn't seem yeah. like um, that that was there, and he was sort of the, the main vehicle for that worldview. Um, yep. Uh, but I, uh, but now there's been a proliferation of, of candidates who are talking more like this. Um, what a, what's that adjustment been like for you? Translating, you know, that agenda from how it would look in a presidential administration to maybe what it looks like in retail politics and potentially mm. as a member of Congress. Sure, I think uh, you know the first thing is you're in executive branch. You have the big dog behind you, yeah, and so you kind of you know that's that's how it goes. But in Congress, you need allies because you're just one vote out of uh, 435. So you need to have uh, coalitions. You need to have relationships with other members. Um, you need to learn how to, you know, they're going to vote for you on something and they disagree with you on other issues. You got to accept that. You know, you're not going to get everything, but if they're going to be with us on this issue, let's let's work with them on this issue. So I think there's a whole lot of relationships and coalitions um, that will be really critical in getting this stuff through. That's probably the number one thing. So that's uh, that's critical. Um, uh, then uh, the Senate. So I, for example, I'm running for the House, but you got to deal with the Senate as well. And it's got its own different culture and its own different uh, uh, the way that they view themselves and the way that they view things. So learning how to navigate that relationship with the Senate, I think, is something that's that's a bit uh, different than being an executive branch because you and the bi being in a bicameral legislature. So mm -hmm. that's interesting. Um, and then. Um, yeah, I mean, I think those are the the key elements is you're part of a huge body instead of just being, you know, Working for one president, you've got other colleagues to work with. Then you've got to think about getting reelected if you want to get reelected. That is so. Um, you know, where's your district at in these issues, and how do you communicate things to people in a way that that they understand, but not compromising your values? Um, so there's a whole issue of constituent relations and um, getting reelected in your district that you've got to think about as well, mm -hmm. and that impacts your votes, obviously. So um, it's quite a, a different mix of things to look at. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you? How do you think the the need to communicate um, with voters is different than communicating with the bureaucracy? I mean, because with the bureaucracy, it's like you got to strong arm them into doing what you want. With voters, you have to you have to communicate in a very different way. How's how's that process been like? Yeah, I mean, I think this is where uh, people like us, so to speak, have huge opportunity because mm. I think we have that. I mean, again, instead of going in and saying. Um, I think we need to cut the corporate tax rate. This is a high priority. I would like to throw your grandma off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, like Paul Ryan. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, just going in and saying, we love families. Yeah. We should even have a whole campaign called We Love Families, period. That's so positive. Like, who could be against that? Or um, You'd be surprised. No, no, right. no, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Or, um, you know, like uh, American Housing for Americans or something like that. Mm. If you go on and have a very you know persuasive guy saying, look, or a family saying, we are trying to buy a house and we can't. We found out that BlackRock and a Chinese firm in this, I bought up all the land. Is this really fair? I will guarantee you most Democrats even will agree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's such a winning message. So I think if we can message things that way with even healthcare, with what we believe. I mean, this whole thing of, oh, just uh, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And that, and that. Well, I mean, our healthcare has got all kinds of problems with it, but it's it's regulated in such a way that the, the interests um, – are getting profits, but it's not necessarily working for the vast bulk of the population. So we even have a winning message there. Of let's make this so that um, we can make it work for everybody. So I, I think we've got that. I think we've got the messaging there for for folks. And again, Trump had that 
in the states he won, including Michigan, where he could do that. He could go in and say, I care about your jobs. They're going to take your jobs away and go to Mexico. We're going to make him pay a price for that. So that's an example of good messaging. So I think we've got that. And yeah, it is very different than communicating with the bureaucracy. But um, uh, I actually think it's kind of fun to go out yeah. and talk to people about this stuff. Yeah. Obviously, you have the, the expertise that you have on the housing issue and, and all the knowledge you're going to bring to bear there. But other than that, um, what are the kind of couple of issues that, that really motivate you, get you out of bed in the morning that you're excited to work on once you're a member of Congress? Um, I just, I feel like I'm um, harping on it almost too much, but this whole thing of families cannot be understated mm -hmm. because you have kids growing up in dangerous environments that could be preventable with smarter policy and they're hurting kids and they're hurting the economy. Um, and I think we really have got to um, uh, think about this issue of families and how do you form more safe, healthy families? That is something that's that I'm really passionate about. So, so that's one thing. Um, I think, and this is maybe not totally a congressional issue, although we, we touch it in some ways, this whole issue of district attorneys letting criminals run free. Mm. Like Jesse Smollett just got uh, you know, released. <laughs> like it was like five days into his yeah. prison sentence or something. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you're an enemy of the regime, they'll put you in solitary confinement, which is literally happening right now. Mm. And Solonichin said this. He said, if you are arrested with a knife, if you're a criminal, they'll let you go. But if you're a political enemy, they'll put you in for treason. Mm. Same crime. You have a knife. And so we're seeing some of that development here as well. And we've got to stop that. So letting all the criminals run free by these DAs, we, maybe we can pull their federal funding from DOJ. There's some things you can do there. But yeah. just reconstruction for San Francisco. That's my policy. at this oh, point. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. you elected the son of weather underground terrorists. You don't get to govern yourself anymore. Sure. Like That's basically my policy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what? how much? How many people can they let die before you yeah. have to take action? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, that's a big issue we've got to address. And then this whole, this critical race theory and the surrounding issues, this is very ominous because it's actually creating more division. And you have this very small number of people pushing this from the NEA and AFT. And I don't know if they realize the level of resentment that they're creating. And it's got to be stopped. And I think that I don't play the race card, but because I happen to be a black man, I can speak on this in ways that certain other people would be immediately called uh, white supremacists. Now, I've been called a white supremacist, too. But it'll so take, have I. It'll take me, <laughs> it's always fun. <laughs> yeah, it'll take me take them five seconds to call me that worse or someone else. It might only take them one second. Yeah. So we at least get a little bit more on that. Yeah. But um, so that's something I, I'm really passionate about speaking out on as well. We've got to we've got to stop that. Um, yeah, I can, those are a few of the issues. There's a lot more out there, but that's great. Yeah. John, how can people follow uh, what you're up to and keep up with with everything that you're doing and saying? VoteJohnGibbs.com. Um, I think we uh, I think we're gonna have a fun year, and I do need uh, people to be with me on it in the various ways. So go to VoteJohnGibbs.com and be part of it. Wonderful. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for everything that you've done over the years serving the movement, and um, yeah, thank you for visiting the swamp. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. I think we had a great talk. Absolutely. Told you that guy was a smart cookie. Uh, and, you know, you can follow everything that he's doing on social media. Uh, once again, 501c3, so we're not endorsing or disendorsing him, but um, thought that that would be a good educational experience for all of you. Uh, again, guys, I can't emphasize enough. Register for Up From Chaos, Conserving American Security. We put this together on a blindingly fast timeline, but we think that right now is a major opportunity to cement um, the gains that we've made over the last seven years on a more restrained and realistic foreign policy. Right now, the neocons in this town are agitating for war. We can't let them win. And so we hope you'll join us. It's on uh, March 31st. You can just go to AmericanMoment.org um, and you can find the information for the conference there, but you can also just go to our social media at AMMoment.org. We're promoting the crap out of it. You can find it. Uh, again, Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, J.D. Vance, Joe Kent, um, uh, Molly Hemingway, Michael Anton, Rachel Bovar, Dan Caldwell, Will Ruger, tons of guests from this podcast talking just about foreign policy ch challenges this country is facing. So we hope you'll join us for that. We hope you'll apply for the uh, Fellowship for American Statecraft. That's AmericanMoment.org slash fellowship. We hope you'll rate and review this podcast five stars. And uh, if you have a question, you can submit it at podcast.americanmoment.org or write it in your review, but only if you rate it five stars. Uh, and we'll be excited to see you guys next week for episode 50 of Moment of Truth. And uh, I guess I can tease who that is. It's uh, Stephen K. Bannon for episode 50 of Moment of Truth. So look forward to that. And we'll see you guys next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. 
Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.